How do you measure or track online worship attendance? What counts as a view? How much should we chase the numbers and what does it mean? It's all coming up. This is the definitive podcast for helping you plan, create, and execute dynamic worship experiences at your church. Useful, practical content in the areas of production, worship, communications, first impressions, and more. This is Making Sunday Happen. Hey guys, this week's episode of the podcast is sponsored by our friends at Messenger AVL. We have used an LED wall from Messenger for the last few conferences that we've been at, and wow, does it make a world of difference. The team serves almost 100% churches, helping them discover audio, video, and lighting, uh, and also broadcast solutions. Uh, Jim Thorne and the team at Messenger have become fast friends of ours, and we highly recommend using them for any AVL needs. You can check them out at messengeravl.com. That's Messenger, then the letters A-V-L dot com. I also want to let you know about our massive holiday sale that we are running from Black Friday, starting on Black Friday. Uh, Here at 1230 Media, we're offering $100 off our Go Unlimited annual plan for the first year. So normally our plan is $396 a year. This brings it down to under $300, $296 a year for the entire library, all of it, unlimited downloads uh, of everything in the library everything we add to the library for the next year. This is a $100 off your first year. And you can go to 1230.media forward slash go and use the code HOLIDAY100 at checkout when signing up for our annual plan. That's the code HOLIDAY100 at checkout at 1230.media slash go. You'll get our entire library, again, unlimited downloads. Uh, It'll take the library from $3.96 to $2.96 for your first year. That's mini movies, countdowns, motion backgrounds, service packs, series in uh, in a box. We call them uh, series in a box or series boxes. Uh, that uh, the the entire library is yours. Uh, it's a steal. Two ninety six a year under three hundred bucks. Again, one two three zero dot media slash uh, forward slash go is the URL for that. Today on the show, I welcome Jim Keat. Jim is the digital minister at the Riverside Church in New York City. Today we're going to be discussing how to track your online attendance. Should you stream to one place or should you stream to all the platforms? What is concurrent views? What's the meaning of that? How should I track them? What if there are multiple people watching our online experience in the same house? How do I count those? Uh, what 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 kind of metrics do I use to count uh, if my entire family is watching at once? Uh, all that and more. We'll dive into all of those questions uh, and more with Jim today. Right after this. Last year, when COVID hit, one of the things we recognized very quickly is that even though we had a beautiful auditorium that had really served our church well for many decades we were way behind technologically. And so we reached out to Messenger and they have come alongside us. They have helped us really begin to reach not just our community, but the world for Jesus. And even all this week, as they've come back in again to help install our LED boards, uh, they're enabling us to minister to our church and our community. The the center screen uh, that they installed that drops during our COVID caution service allows us to live stream from our West Campus, which again enables us to minister to those who are very concerned about the virus or perhaps they work in a a profession or work for an employer that requires them to take those extra steps uh, to have lots of space. And so 50 to 100 people in a thousand seat auditorium, there's all kinds of room. And so Messenger has enabled us again, to continue to minister to our church family, our local community, and literally around the world to get the good news of the gospel out. Hey guys, today I welcome Jim Keat. Jim is the digital minister at the Riverside Church in New York City and the director of online innovation at the Convergence Network. He is also a digital consultant to various faith agencies and organizations Jim, welcome, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. 
So give me a little bit about your your ministry experience. You've kind of uh, been around a little bit in church world and ministry world. Give me a little bit of your background. Yeah, I mean, I, I literally grew up in this thing. My dad uh, is a retired pastor. My earliest memories are being pushed up and down his office chair in the basement of a small Lutheran church in Iowa. Uh, I you know, was the, the weird kid in high school who decided to fill notebooks with his own commentary on the New Testament. Doesn't everyone write a commentary on the book of Matthew during their free period in high school? Nope, just me. Uh, and just then, you, you know, college. <laughs> I studied ministry, youth ministry in undergrad, youth pastor at a, you know, big church in West Michigan for about 10 years, and then minister of education at a uh, church in New York City, and then at the Riverside Church for about the past six or seven so far, all, always focused specifically on these areas of digital content and digital engagement. And for the last three years, I've been Riverside's digital minister. So summer of 2019, we shifted my role to focus specifically on cultivating our online congregation, Just creating online time. content. I know that's the ironic thing. Summer <laughs> of 2019 is an interesting date to put when you become digital minister, because that yeah. was when co colleagues and congregants were like, what's a digital minister? And then yeah. fast forward 12 months. Yeah. Oh, thank God we have a digital oh, minister. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. So people should know that you you founded uh, Free and Simple, which is a platform to share your Airstream travels. Nothing really to do with uh, what we're going to talk about today. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just interested. Uh, so you guys lived in an Airstream for, for a, a year. year traveling yeah, around, right? Yeah, that's when I started working remote in 2019. You know, before working from home was the thing to do, I was just working from a mobile home. And yeah, we, we bought an Airstream, left New York, traveled uh, mainly the East Coast, then got pregnant. Then there was a pandemic. So we decided we would like a little more stability for this yeah. season of life. So we, now we take the Airstream out in the summer and we take our two boys on all sorts of camping trips. Yeah, I was uh, watching some of your YouTube videos. Uh, you guys had a lot of fun uh, doing that. So did your church... Uh, were you at the Riverside and the church just let you do that for a year or how did that work? Yeah, it was going to be an ongoing thing. The The thought was, and this was a really fun thing that, that the pandemic kind of obviously shifted a lot of plans. So uh, we just wanted to, it was an experiment. What happens if we have a minister of the church who's not bound to the, the local parish? So I could really focus on these online spaces, but then what if that digital pastor is actually traveling around and, hey, I'm mm -hmm. in Savannah, Georgia. We have a congregant who worships online from Georgia. Let me take you out for coffee. When was the last time someone who's not in the local area of the church got to be got to meet with one of their local pastors. So I got to meet with some of our remote congregants uh, when I was in the right area as them. But then the pandemic shifted a lot of things. So we didn't quite lean into that, though we are thinking through some ways to bring some of that back in the upcoming mm. years as travels a bit more uh, amenable to people. But Very yeah. interesting. So how, how was that experience? Did you guys drive each other nuts in the <laughs> Airstream or what was some of the pluses and minuses? Oh, well, neither of us had ever towed anything before or driven a giant truck. So there was a big learning curve on just the things you needed to make it work. And we had, you know, a 28 foot Airstream at the time. Now we have a 16 foot Airstream. So we traded it in for a little tiny one, even though our family has doubled. We have two kids now, uh, but we, we had a blast. We loved the adventure. We loved seeing yeah. new areas. Um, we experienced that it was very interesting to live in the places where people vacationed. That was an interesting just cognitive mindset we had to get around um, mm -hmm. because it, it never felt like you were really doing either of those. So that's where the shift now to traveling just mainly during the summer has been a good shift. We can look forward to those trips rather than being perpetually in motion. How was the internet? So that would be my fear oh. is <laughs> oh. spotty I, internet. I, yeah, yeah, we, we were set. So I made sure of that. The Airstream had internet through AT&T our truck had internet through Sprint, and then we had a hotspot and our phones through Verizon. So I would, I had a reliable source no matter where I was. Basically, gotcha. if if I couldn't get on one of those three, then I just you know was completely out of luck, I guess. But good, yeah. good call, good call. All right, so tell me about your job at Riverside Church. What all are you currently responsible for? How is your, you know, uh, job shifted a little bit? I'm sure it has over the last couple of years. But uh, what all are you responsible for? Yeah, I like to think that I primarily do three things. Uh, one, uh, I help the various ministries and other clergy at the church 
in what does what's a digital expression of their ministry look like I, i'm not the one doing all the digital ministry for everybody i think that's just not sustainable similar to like if you if a church has a social justice pastor they're not the one doing all the social justice or if you have a youth pastor hopefully they're not the only person who knows young people's names but they're the ones who are helping the entire congregation do that work together so I'm kind of the champion for all things digital and helping people grow into that contextually. Um, that also means I, I bring just an awareness to that digital space and experience. So I'm thinking of the online congregant and what is a worship service like from their point of view and advocating for intentional shifts we make there. Uh, but the other piece with that is I'm making digital stuff. I'm, I'm trying to create online content, both as an example to my colleagues so they can see the ways we can use different platforms and spaces. But I also just believe that online content can be like a, a digital campfire that community can gather around and be formed by. So I'm trying to cultivate our online community largely by inviting congregants to be contributors and co-creators of our online stuff, um, and then just to make that as well. And then the third piece would probably be helping other churches in the ways that they need to lean into their expressions of digital ministry. Uh, Riverside has been around for a while. We're about a 92 year old church. We're literally the tallest church in North America. So we have a bit of a legacy in times to lean into. And so I think uh, we don't wanna just live in our past, but live in the present and the future and help other churches take the next best step, specifically in all things digital. What denomination, uh, people, uh, we're, we're probably leaning more, uh... I guess evangelistic, Protestant, Baptist, Methodist is probably the area that we uh, yeah. mostly serve in. And so you're using words like congregants, parish, <laughs> clergy. Uh, so give give us kind of your your background denominationally. Yeah, I mean, I I come from a mutt of denominations. Grew up Missouri Synod Lutheran. Went to a non-denominational Bible college. Worked at a non-denominational progressive evangelical mega church and then somehow made it into the reformed world of the protestant church uh, but riverside particularly is duly affiliated as a, the american baptist denomination and the united church of christ uh, so it's it was founded john rockefeller funded the thing 92 years ago uh, and mm -hmm. the first preacher was a guy named harry emerson fosdick who uh made a name for himself for a lot of reasons one when he preached a sermon called shall the fundamentalists win uh, which this was a hundred years ago. He preached that sermon, which is an interesting concept. So Riverside is a, uh, yeah, we were a place where Martin Luther King would preach every year, uh, including his penultimate ser uh, speech uh, uh, a year before his assassination. So it's a, it's a fun place, but yeah. So for those who are listening to the podcast and not seeing it, you're also waving your arm around with a lot of tattoos. So you're just, <laughs> you're just from all over the place, man. You're just uh, blowing the minds of our, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. So I want to talk to you about, I love having you on, man. And I, I love uh, hearing from different denominations here and, uh, you know, from different points of view and perspectives. Um, so let's talk about, you You just put a, a video on YouTube a little while ago, all about tracking your online worship service. So yep. I want to get into that. So in online world, what should we be paying attention to? What what should we be focusing on? Well, when it comes to things like, you know, the numbers and stuff, I, I think the numbers only, generally the numbers matter most in the trends they communicate. I never want to get bogged down to the specificity of like, oh, that, that particular, it's worth paying attention to to see why do certain things gain greater traction than others. Uh, but that's generally it. So I like seeing those trends in the numbers and particularly with like the, the attendance for our Sunday morning worship service, I I'm tracking it meticulously because I want to figure out what's our new normal going to be. Uh, I, I, I have data back to 2019. We've had, we've had an online congregation prior to that, but we used a different platform. So we lost some of the data. Uh, but since 2019, we've been using the same platform for online stuff. So I can track in person and online uh, numbers to just see how has that normal changed. And it's, for us, it's changed quite dramatically. Back in 2019, pre-pandemic, we were probably 80% on site and 20% online. Hmm. And now we're at a solid 60% online and 40% on site. And I'm just wondering, is that gonna stay steady? Is that gonna change? So I, I look at those numbers to see what those trends are. And if I can find out what those new normals might be, that informs a lot of the ways we design gatherings and engage people in those spaces. So you guys only stream to YouTube, is that correct? We do. The stream just goes to YouTube, but then we have that embedded on our website for ease okay. of access there. Uh, we, we, we used to stream to multiple locations, uh, and Facebook was probably where the most kind of 
live chat would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but then once the pandemic hit, we wanted to create one kind of digital space for everybody, one digital sanctuary that everyone gathers in. So there's one live chat that everyone's in. They're all participating together. And uh, let's be honest, also one place for me to track metrics right. rather than aggregating it from three or four places. And that's only that's only YouTube. So let me ask you this. So one thing that's a little bit different than one thing that I, I teach on, I, I kind of teach that your website, whether that's an embed from YouTube is fine, but your website be your hub because you can control that environment. Yeah. Whereas YouTube or Facebook, they can take you down at a moment's notice for anything they want to. Yeah. So how does that land with you? What's your opinion on that? No, I think you're you're right on there in in the who, who controls the real estate kind of a thing. I think when it comes to our online video, we have we have uh, allowed ourselves to be okay with whatever whims YouTube might pull, uh, mainly because we've seen them give us an incredible reach that we didn't know was possible. Uh, right. So we we're, we recognize that possibility. We've had one moment. <laughs> it was the sun the the Sunday before I returned from paternity leave with our first kid. I come back to find out that our YouTube account is suspended for copyright infringement, and we can't live stream anymore because the week before I got back, they decided to play a recorded clip of Ruth Bader Ginsburg from NPR, and so NPR was like, "That's our clip. You don't own that." So we got in, you know, YouTube timeout for a while, and I was like, "Of course, it's the week before I'm back. You all break the internet." So. <laughs> Things like that. So you might had to happen, come back and fix it. That. Yeah, exactly. That's funny. All right. So a lot of people are wondering and have wondered through the last couple of years, especially, is how do I count a view? Do I count, yeah. you know, the people watching right now? Do I count also the replay? Where? How do I track that and all that? So I want to kind of dive into the numbers and how you do this. So talk to me about peak concurrent viewers. Why is that the number that you look at? What is it and why do you look at that? Yeah, I, I pay attention to peak concurrent viewers and I multiply it by 1.5 to get a sense of the number of people who are attending our Sunday morning worship service online in that real time moment. Now I got the 1.5 number by literally surveying our online congregants asking, when you're worshiping with us, how many people are with you? Is it just you, you and one person, your family? How many is that? And the average came out to 1.6. So I felt okay bringing it down to 1.5 for my math. So that, that lets me get that equation. And I do peak concurrent because I'm really interested in that new normal. What's our congregation in the live moment of a Sunday morning? So in my mind, peak concurrent viewers is the most parallel metric to number of butts sitting in the pews in the room. And I want to also say I am looking at that peak concurrent number and noticing that it, it generally stays level. We're not getting giant spikes and drops. So my dad is not thrown off there. We, we, we rise. And by the time we get to the first hymn and the sermon, we're at kind of our general peak and that goes strong until the closing hymn. And then it drops off a little bit from there. So I feel confident using that number. People say, oh, but it's not foolproof. What if someone comes on and leaves? They didn't get counted in your attendance. But that's always been true of our in-person attendance. What if someone goes to the bathroom when the usher's counting and then they didn't get counted for that one moment kind of a thing? Mm -hmm. But again, that's where the specific number is less important to me than the general trend that it shows. And I track the data week to week so I can pay attention to those larger trends to let those inform the, the small but significant things we do in a worship service. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about, do you need to go? No, I'm good. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, we're not going to cut this out. You have a baby in the other room and you have two now, right? So you just That's have right. a, you just have a young one there with you or you have both of them? The, the two-year-old is at daycare and I have the seven-month-old on uh, the baby monitor. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this is a uh, raw and real right here. This is a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not made up. All right. So uh, so how does that data, you mentioned this a couple of times. Let's talk about how that data influences how you craft your worship experience. How does it change the welcome? How does it change the elements within your service? Your, your service? How do you craft the experience based on the numbers that you find? I mean, one very small but incredibly significant thing is where does the worship leader or preacher look? Where should they be making eye contact mm -hmm. uh, and recognizing if they're not looking into we have a multi camera setup, but we have one that's kind of designated as the best eyesight from the pulpit and lectern. That's, you know, mainline Protestant for the place the preacher stands. Uh, we have a, a primary camera that we recommend they look towards for those moments. And then our tech team catches their eye and bring make sure that camera is being on on the broadcast. But if they're never looking at that camera, they're right. literally ignoring most of the congregation. So it's just ways of reminding them uh, 
to, to maintain that connection with the entire congregation. Uh, and then we do things like we always try to have at least one, if not more, pieces of worship led by some pre-recorded content from a remote member of our community or myself. I, I live in Michigan. I'm not in New York where the church is either. Uh, but that's a way of bringing those online congregants into the space and centering them. We never want it to feel like they're just peeking in through the windows and watching church happen, but we right. want them to be connected with and engaged. Or, or to keep rambling, a third one we've done, we start the worship service by asking everyone online to share in the live chat where they're joining us from. And then we have some question that kind of connects to the themes of that day that we invite them to respond to. And then before the end of the service at the benediction, I send a Slack message to whoever's leading the benediction saying, here's how many people were worshiping online today. Cause I can just be tracking that peak concurrent number during the service. Um, here's where they were worshiping from and here's how they responded to that. So they get brought to the center of the space, so to speak, rather than just left on the edges. That's a few. There's more too, but yeah. Yeah. And I really love that approach. I've been um, kind of teaching that approach too, that it's not a security camera in the back of the room, yeah. you know, that it, that it's an experience. And so to maybe treat your online experience like a campus of your church. So yeah. you wouldn't start a campus and leave the building empty and not have welcome uh, fo yeah. folks and not have uh, you staff it, not pour money into it, that sort of thing. Uh, and so kind of the, kind of the same way is, uh, and you wouldn't never mention that other campus necessarily yes. in what from one campus to another, you are, you're one church in two locations. And I feel the same with online. This is one church in two locations that people are yeah. meeting online and, and some in the physical space. Um, and so, yeah, I agree with you. I think, you know, if the pastor can find the red light, you know, in the camera and talk directly to that, that sort of thing uh, to bring to bring the online folks into the space. Good points. All right. So um, uh, I was just going to uh, read my notes, just just going through how you text the pastors, the data. I love that, how you incorporate that information into the, the service live there. Um, how do you uh, let's talk about playback. How do you track viewers who are watching playback and not live? Yeah, we so I keep a tally. Um, <clears throat> I update it every few weeks or so. I don't need to do it as real time. I, I look at specifically our Sunday morning worship service. I look at the number of views 24 hours later, seven days later, 28 days later, and 365 days later. Simply again, I, the, the general numbers are nice, but I like the general trends so I can tell our, our congregants, hey, this online thing isn't, it's more than just the live moment. We, we consistently see within a day, it doubles in views. Within a month, it triples in views. It usually flatlines there and we don't get much more growth over the year. Uh, but just for people to say, the people who go to church aren't just the people who go at 10 45 a.m on a sunday right. it, it, this stuff we do in this online space has the ability and it actually does reach so many more people than we could ever imagine so i i just i, I track that information so i can share it with our commissions and committees and groups just so we can rewire and reframe our mindsets of what 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 are we designing for and what's the purpose and then you can start seeing oh this this is more than just an interesting concept this is something we need to lean into because it gives us the possibility of reaching and engaging so many more people than ever before. I like how you have a spreadsheet that tracks that the, the peak right. viewers in the moment. And then, uh, at, at other times to, to show how that audience grew over time. Um, okay. So let's talk about a few tips for hybrid church. So what are some highlights of the things that you've shared about hybrid and digital ministry? You have a YouTube channel, on how to do digital ministry better and well. Uh, so what are some of the top tips maybe that you've learned over the last few years? Oh, I mean, the, the eye contact one is the one I constantly go back to and all my colleagues are, they, they know I'm going to say it in every meeting, but I think it makes such a significant difference. And, and I think mm -hmm. it's important because in any season when churches were online only, we all got really good at looking directly into the camera. And then suddenly once people got back in the seats, we got distracted and just looked at the whatever number of humans were in the room and missed out on the humans on those online spaces. So yeah. that's one for sure. But the other that you already hinted at to some extent too, if you think about this online stuff, this hybrid, the, the people in this online space as a second campus for your work and your ministry, you do think about investing into it intentionally. Uh, and I, I hear a lot of pastors who say, but I can't do all that. I can't greet people in the online space and I can't produce, I can't be in all those places. Like, do you teach every Sunday school class? Are you the greeter at every door? No, you cultivated a, a, a 
a community who supports those things together. It's the same in these online spaces. It's not going to happen in two seconds. It's going to take time, but you have to do the intentional work of building that culture to recognize what needs are there. How do we recruit volunteers, hire staff to support that? I think people need to just take it seriously, even if it doesn't happen overnight. Recognize, yeah, we're, we're making a big cultural shift in our communities, and that's going to take time, but it's necessary and it's definitely worth it. Tell me about sit, the importance of sitting in the online seat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a firm believer that anyone who is leading in-person services but has a congregation who's gathering in an online way, at least once a quarter, I say, you got to sit in their seat. You, gotta, you, you don't get the day off, but you're worshiping online simply mm-hmm. to re-engage your empathy for the online congregant. During you know, COVID in its peak, when we were all online, we all suddenly realized what is good and what's not so good of the online worshiping experience. But now that we're returning to these in-person spaces, it's easy to default to the way we used to do things. Uh, but the minute you go back to sitting in front of your computer or your phone or your device for worship, you're like, oh yeah, they're never looking at me. They're, they're, or they only look at the camera when they're talking about the online congregants. I mean, come on, we don't look at the in-person congregants only when we're talking about them. So it just engages and cultivates that empathy. I think we constantly need to remind ourselves of uh, how do we sit in the seats where the people are worshiping so we can best lead them in the spaces and the places that they are. How about how authenticity uh, is greater than production value? Oh, I feel like you're reading from one of my videos here. <laughs> I am, man. I took a deep dive into your channel. It's so good. Very good information. <laughs> People need to check it out. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think it is easy to get tied up in, you know, the lights and the glamour of production value. And don't get me wrong, it serves a purpose. You know, I got a sure SM7B right here and trying to figure out three point lighting and all that good stuff. But I think being your authentic self is always what's most important. The, the risk becomes you see what someone else is doing and you think I need to have my thing be just like theirs. Mm-hmm. And then you get so caught up in the production value or maybe you even buy all the gear, but you're the only person who knows how to do it that it doesn't actually get pulled off with any sort of consistency. And I think if you can consistently be you, that's that's what we've always needed to be. I mean, you you, ne- you can learn from other preachers, but you need to be your authentic preaching self in the pulpit. Same in any aspect of ministry. Learn from others, but show up as yourself. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I talk with my hands a lot and wave them around on the camera. That's me being me, and that's who I should be in these spaces. Our, our senior minister, is a little different than that. And that's okay. That's what she needs to be. How do we all be our authentic selves in these? She made a video last week. We just got our senior minister starting to make, we have a new senior minister, so it's easy to get her to do new things. She makes a weekly 90 second video that we share um, on all the various short form vertical socials and then with our congregation, but just a pastoral message to our congregants. And she filmed it this last week, recovering from a cold and talking about the need, you know, like for, we tend to think our value comes from all the things we do. And then your body reminds you it doesn't. And I'm like, I just love that her first debut video was her with a cold and she wasn't afraid to be that authentic self. And that connected with so many of our congregants because of that authenticity. So I'm all about any faith leader not feeling the need to be someone else on camera, but just ask, well, who am I in any space and how can I be that in this space? Good. All right. You have a few incredible ideas uh, from your YouTube channel that I want to talk about. Um, Is One of them is tell me about a sermon talk back video series. What is that? Why should I start one? Oh, okay. So I think um, this was a recent video. I just was like, here's some ideas people should do. I, I think I think you should repurpose as much as you can. Uh, yeah. We have, we have all have the same 1,440 minutes in a day, uh, and you spend a lot of them sleeping and some of them eating, and hopefully a good amount just doing things that you just enjoy doing. So so, a pastor spends a lot of time working on their sermon. I think it's a shame if it only gets 20 or so minutes in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm a fan of, you know, repurposing in various ways, take content for, you know, quotes on social, repurpose clips for shorts and TikTok. But then I think like even just give more access to it. So uh, I think the idea I recommended in that video was have the preacher and a couple colleagues, couple congregants just sit down, whether it's Sunday afternoon, Monday morning, and just have a conversation about the sermon that was preached. I think in my mind, that is a couple things. One, it just squeezes a bit more content out of that moment. But pedagogically, it also allows people to recognize the sermon doesn't end at the amen. It keeps going and Mm -hmm. hopefully it finds a way into our lives beyond that moment. So let's 
create a program that literally puts it outside of the sermon. At, at Riverside, we do this literally on Sunday after worship. We have our virtual coffee hour on Zoom, and the preacher joins us for that. And then we host a sermon talk back with them there. So it's in that Zoom space, and we record it and then produce that the audio of that for a podcast. So finding just ways to, to get as much as possible out of that for the access of people who want to go deeper, but really for that muscle of saying, the sermon has to work into our lives beyond just the Sunday morning service. So let's literally put the sermon beyond the Sunday morning service. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people you, you might have the mindset of struggling with, well, I have to produce more content. I have to always. Well, I mean, if you're the pastor, I mean, you you already are a content machine. Yes. That your pastor's producing a huge chunk of Sunday morning that you can reuse over and over. And a couple other ideas that you had with this is one is creating a sermon prep podcast. Tell me yeah. about that. Just on the opposite side, just have the pastor sit down, you know, prior to the sermon, prior to Sunday, talk through ideas. It could be still in a rough shape. Maybe you're talking with congregants, with other clergy colleagues, whoever, and just talk about what you're thinking for that sermon. In my mind, that does at least three things. The pastor gets, you know, just another space to try out ideas and workshop what they're going to be preaching on that Sunday. So it's just literal sermon prep for them. It helps any congregants who hear this kind of start priming their kind of mind for what to expect from Sunday. And then they're, they, they are ready to even be more engaged with it. And I think that kind of thing can become a wonderful resource to other preachers who are just like, what am I preaching this week? I don't know. Let me go see what Bob put on his sermon prep podcast and I'll borrow an idea or two from him there. <laughs> Uh, another idea on the flip side after the sermon uh, is turning your sermon into a Twitter thread oh, or yeah. so social media posts in general. Yeah, that, that came from a, a former colleague of mine who said, I, I know I should be on Twitter, but I don't know what to say. And I'm like, you write a sermon 45 Sundays a year. Just take a few lines from that and tweet yeah. it. There's your Twitter thread. And statistically, Twitter threads seem to get more traction and engagement than just single tweets anyway. Uh, or turn it into a quote graphic or something because a photo image gets more traction as well. So just yeah. ways to take that, be intentional about it. Because the challenge can be, oh, I can't fit my best part of my sermon into one tweet. You don't have to. That's what Twitter threads are for. Make it multiple tweets and it can go even further. Good. All right, rapid fire before I leave you, okay? You ready? Bring it on. Here we go, quick fire. What is one thing that my church could do with digital ministry this week that would be a game changer? Oh, um, say hello to people when they log in. Whether it's on Zoom, say hi to them by name, or in the live chat, respond and say hi. Good. Number two, what is a trend for social media and digital ministry that we should be paying more attention to? Uh, probably TikTok because it, whether we like where it anything about it, it has probably the currently the smartest algorithm in that I've seen on the internet. So at least pay attention to it, or maybe in general, short form vertical video content is the larger trend there. Mm, good, good. All right, number three. What are one or two ways that we can be more authentic online with our digital ministry? Oh, uh, do it more consistently. I think when you do it just once or twice, you get you're in your nerves. Like if you only preach once, you're gonna feel like ah. Oh, but once you start doing it, you know, 50 times, you get just more authentic and more natural. So don't. The only way to get from A to Z is to start A B C D E. You gotta just go through the whole alphabet. Good. Number four. What's the difference between church online and online church? Oh, I didn't. I can't. How can I answer this shortly? Oh, this was. This was. This was going deeply. Okay. Um. Online church or church online is telling me where church is happening today, but online church tells me what kind of church it is. Did I get that right? I always flip this around. The point being, are we simply talking about where church is happening or how church is happening? I think it's a subtle difference, but leads to a big implication. So what should we say? Online church? I think we should say online church because it's the type of church. It's not just the location. It's it's uh, doing church online means I take the way the way I've always done church and I just replicate it online. To do online church means we are going to let it grow naturally out of this context and container and what needs to be the the unique aspects for this specific space. Good. Really, the point is just think intentionally about what you're doing and where it's coming from. Good. All right, last one. What's your favorite or go-to social media platform that you see the most impact on? Oh, most, that's a, that's a really hard one. Um, probably YouTube because the ability to have short form, long form content, I think it's got a longer lifespan. So it's not the ebbs and flows of the current TikTok world. Um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say YouTube has the ability to have diversity of content <clears throat> and cultivate community pretty well. 
All right, bonus one for you. Uh, where do you see us going? Like, what is the next iteration of the internet, church, church online, online church? Uh, where where should we be looking to in the next five to ten years? Uh, well, I think we need to pay attention to whatever Mark Zuckerberg and company are doing with VR. Mm. Uh, mm. They have they have some interesting rationale for the the ability to improve and increase presence among people in online spaces, and I'm just paying attention to what that could be. Although I think, in the way that three to five years ago, talking about doing church online, online church, any of this stuff, live streaming, hybrid, got kind of funny looks from people. I think that's what VR is getting now. Like, oh, I thought we just got used to live streaming. Now I have to do VR. So I think we're not there, but I think that's the thing to pay attention to. Uh, and I think it's important to pay attention to, are we simply you know, producing content for consumption or are we actually cultivating community? That was a lot of alliteration in there. It was, it was, you did well. Um, so I agree with you. I've been asked that a lot in the workshops and, and breakouts and stuff I've led at conferences is where are we going? What is the next thing to look for? And that's my answer too. I think it's VR. Um, I'm, I've had a uh, DJ Soto. I, I just interviewed him and what they're at VR church and just kind of learning uh, about that and Oculus headsets and, and all that. And interesting at VR church, they have volunteer teams that create their world creation teams. <laughs> so their, their job as a volunteer team is to create, you know, a big ship or huge water elements that when the sermon starts, the water starts flowing in, or there's a big boat over here that I can turn and look at, like <laughs> things like that, like actually wow. interactive elements. Wow. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. That's, I think imp- that's impressive. Uh, that, that's, that's a whole new altar guild right there. Yeah, I, I, exactly. <laughs> well, I know that like Life Church, Elevation, and others are doing VR, but it's more watching the pastor yes. on the screen. DJ like has a, a different. Campus. That's yeah. right. Well, the, DJ has a different point of view on that. He mentioned like, why would I watch? Why don't I just watch it on my computer? Like, why am I going to be in VR watching? Why not make it interactive? What VR exactly. is intended to be, and I, I totally exactly. agree with that. I think it's very interesting. So that's that's where I'm watching. Uh, well, man, great ideas. I loved diving into your YouTube channel. Uh, tell us where we can find that. How we can check you out. Uh, YouTube channel is youtube.com slash digital minister. Uh, you can find that link and all other things I do at jimkeet.com, J-I-M-K-E-A-T.com. And then Riverside's website is trcnyc.org. And there's awesome. all sorts of good stuff on all of Well, if we see an Airstream driving around, we might think <laughs> it's you. you. might. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the time, man. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Hey guys, I wanted to let you know about our massive holiday sale here at 1230 Media. For a limited time, we are offering our entire library, our Go Unlimited annual plan, for $100 off the regular price. That means that instead of $396 a year, you're getting unlimited downloads of mini movies, countdowns, series boxes, packs, title and social graphics, and more for only $296 a year. It's a steal under 300 bucks for the entire library for a year. Everything currently in the library plus all new releases for the next year. And we are adding to the library literally daily. Just go to 1230.media slash go. That's 1230.media slash go. And use the code HOLIDAY100 at checkout when signing up for our annual plan. Again, 1230.media slash G-O and use the code HOLIDAY100 when signing up for our annual plan. That's 1230.media slash go. The show notes for this episode are available now at makingsundayhappen.com. 
Hey guys, really want you to take advantage of that holiday sale, $100 off our entire library. We want to make things as affordable as possible. I know that money and budgets is an issue uh, in a lot of churches today, especially in today's economy. So we want to offer as much discount as we possibly can uh, and still make it as a ministry. So uh, $100 off, go limited. Be sure to check that out. All right, thanks so much for joining us this week. Next week, I'm going to take you into a whole new world. We're going to dive in to the world of virtual reality church. I've had a few folks on the show a few months ago where we gave you an intro to VR and how new churches are starting to incorporate it. Uh, But next week, I talked to a real pioneer in the space. Bishop or Pastor DJ Soto will join me. DJ leads VR Church, a church solely 100% in virtual reality. And since my interview with DJ, I've done some deep research into VR. I'll show you my Oculus headset and how I've attended DJ's church. I'll show you some pictures and what it looks like inside the headset, inside the metaverse. Uh, I'm going to give you a full introduction into what VR and the metaverse is, uh, multiple metaverses, actually. Uh, We'll talk about that, kind of a beginner's guide next week. Uh, I'll also talk to DJ about how they are doing church totally different than you've ever seen before. I'll also talk to uh, DJ about what his version of Church Online looks like uh, and what he thinks that the future holds uh, in this new medium, whether uh, churches should be doing that, whether having uh, physical spaces as well as virtual reality experiences, all of that will be next week on the show. It's going to be really incredible. Do not miss it. Well, go out there and create some incredible worship experiences at your church this weekend. I'll catch you next week. Making Sunday Happen is a production of the Ministry of 1230 Media. For show notes, archive episodes, and more free resources for your church, visit makingsundayhappen.com.